presentation I want to give you is um, about a, a short a collaborative project that we did uh, at the MTC with uh, two Midlands-based SMEs. And they were interested in looking at additive manufacturing and specifically what the design process is for additive, uh, especially for fairly complex uh, geometries like the, uh, the fork bottom you can see on the slide. And I thought it'd be interesting just to share with you what the project came up with in terms of a, uh, a workflow needed for, for this process and to see how accessible designing this sort of uh, uh, geometry is for an SME uh, who is just wanting to get into additive uh, manufacturing. So just a, a little bit about uh, the MTC where I work. Um, we're a uh, research uh, organization, we're just down the road in Coventry, and we're part of the high value manufacturing uh, catapult, which uh, was set up by the, the government, uh, and there are centers spread around the UK. And uh, the purpose of these centers is to try and keep uh, UK innovation in the UK and get it to a point where it's ready to be used by industry. Um, and so the role we have as uh, one of these centers is to um, take a process that's emerging but not ready to be used by industry and remove uh, risk and uncertainty from the process so that it can then be adopted by industry uh, as, as, a, as, a, a, as, as a mature uh, process. And one of the, the areas we look at is uh, additive manufacturing. So um, the project that we did um, with the two SMEs was based around um, uh, an additive manufacturing process called um, selective laser melting. Um, and for those of you who aren't familiar with it, it's, uh, it's similar to 3D printing, all the 3D printing processes in that uh, components are produced in a layer by layer basis. And uh, selective laser melting uses a, a metal powder as a raw material and the powder is consolidated into geometry using uh, a laser to, to melt it. Um, but the, the, the workflow we look at now here is, is generally going to apply to any of these additive manufacturing processes with small variations. So the presentation really is about as much uh, the component, but also about the actual workflow. And what I'm going to do is show you what we did in terms of how did we get to this form, and then say, um, have a quick look at whether this is an accessible workflow to an SME, and at the end, just a, a brief uh, slide on how this fits the MTC's uh, strategy. So the first of the SMEs involved in the project was a company called KTEC. They um, design and manufacture um, uh, motorcycle suspension components. So their interest was, you know, can additive manufacturing actually make me a part that's lighter than I can get using uh, another um, manufacturing process? And specifically, uh, the component they, were, they, were, they offered us was the, the bottom of the fork. It basically holds the front wheel onto the, onto the motorbike, so a small but not uh, insignificant uh, component for them. And that's the one we, we, we had a look at. And in terms of uh, its function as, a, as an engineering component, it's basically, uh, its job is to hold uh, three things together. It has to hold the wheel on to the fork, and the fork uh, is held on as well, so it combines those two things. And it also needs to hold the brake caliper in position so that that can slow down the wheel. So those are the three components that are uh, creating loads on this, uh, on this engineering uh, component. To get straight to the, the chase, this was the component before and that was the component after. So we achieved with this project uh, a saving across both forks, there's two on the motorbike obviously, a saving of 300 grams, 302 grams. Um, the other SME involved uh, in the project were a GRM and they're a design consultant uh, who basically, this is their bread and butter, they, they design uh, components. And uh, we designed this component with them and there's actually a model of the optimized component or a couple of models of the optimized component on their stand here at the TCT. And so we worked with them on the project. The question is, how did we get from the before model to the, to the afterwards model? Well, what happens in this sort of workflow is, uh, if you have an idea and you need to get it into your machine and you want it to be um, a complex optimized form, there, there are essentially three steps you go through. You, uh, you have to define what the component's going to do in an engineering sense. And then you basically ask an algorithm to help you out and propose a, a solution for you, which you then uh, sanity check. And when you're happy with it, you create a geometry based on the suggestion from the algorithm, and uh, then you send it off to the AM machine. So um, what we're going to do is um, show these steps. So first of all, working out what the, what the component needs to do. So we, we, uh, you, we, you look at several load cases. So in our case, we talked to KTEC and the suggestion was a bike uh, doing an endo, braking, coming into a pothole and slamming into the pothole. And we were told that that's about equivalent to a 3G uh, deceleration force that's acting on the wheel. 
So if you resolve uh, that acceleration into forces that are acting on the on the fork it's on the fork bottom itself, you've got this 9.4 kilonewton force uh, on the on the fork uh, from the front from the axle, and another 9.2 from the actual caliper in terms of a rotational force. Um, so that's what you tell the algorithm. You say these are my forces, and then you, you end this, uh, define the volume that the algorithm is allowed to create uh, geometry in. Uh, so we repeat this for alternative load cases like uh, doing a, a poorly executed wheelie and slamming down on the front fork. But this, this, uh, this scenario was uh, considered the worst one. So it's the one we, we used. And um, the algorithm goes away with this information and comes up with this blobby thing, um, which is the algorithm saying, well, actually, this is where you need to place material in this volume to transfer the load. So it's, generally gonna, it's just generally going to join areas where loads are coming into this volume with material. And so that's, that's essentially the suggestion that you have to work on. Um, now obviously, uh, depending on what material you're, you're using, um, the, 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 the form that's suggested is going to change. The stiffer the material, the stronger the material, the less material you're going to use. So in parallel with um, telling the, the algorithm what the boundary conditions are and the design volume, you have to also consider the material in order to get the right amount of material in this volume. Um, and so in terms of the, the process that we were using, selective laser melting, there aren't that many materials available. There are basically four, uh, five groups, broadly speaking. Aluminium, nickel, titanium, and the steels. And the miscellaneous ones are the precious metals. You can do copper, you can do cobalt chrome. But the main sort of uh, engineering uh, types of material groups are the, the other four. And the original component was uh, uh, an aluminium alloy, 6082. Uh, and uh, happily enough, uh, one of the two materials available in selective laser melting is this uh, casting alloy the SI10MG, which had the similar properties to the, um, the original components. So uh, that was used to tell the algorithm about the material properties. And that's what it used to come up with the form that I, that I showed you earlier. So you've got the suggestion. And you can't actually make that. It would be a nightmare. It would be full of uh, stress erasers everywhere. And it obviously, it's not really the finished item. So the next step in the process is uh, having accepted the, the suggestion from the uh, algorithm is to actually create a model. Then it's a proper engineering model. It's, it's smooth. It's got um, uh, good, good form. Um, and in this project, the actual topology optimization or suggestion from the algorithm was done in um, SOLIDWORKS using um, GRM's TrueForm plugin. So it's an add-in that you put into the CAD environment, you're still working in the environment. And so for the, for the remodeling phase, it, it made sense to stay in, in SOLIDWORKS and just uh, view the, the suggestion and create your engineering surfaces uh, visually by trying to follow um, the form that's suggested. So that's what's done uh, in, in uh, this stage. And basically, the, the modeling of the geometries is finished in terms of a form that will do the job. So the next thing you have to do is consider the, the actual manufacturing process. In reality, you'll be considering this as you go along, but um, we've got a linear story. So the next thing uh, I'll show you is the fact that we had to do some uh, remodeling. So the, um, the, the image on the left is the original component which we uh, modeled, as I showed you in the previous slide. Now, selective laser melting uh, uses supports like many other 3D printing processes. And these in red are the supports that are needed for this process. The difference with these supports to supports for 3D printing in polymers, for example, is that they're not water soluble in any way. They're the same material as the parent material, which means getting that off is going to be uh, a pain. Uh, it's literally a hammer and chisel uh, territory. So you're really uh, spending a lot of time uh, in selective laser melting or metal additive manufacturing, looking at how you can minimize supports because it's uh, a big burden downstream. Um, so what we did in this model, we worked with uh, GRM and explained the design rules. It's basically to do overhangs and heat dissipation. And you can just tweak the model to make it so that it can be built with less supports, uh, which are easier to remove. So that's, that's, that was the next step. Uh, and following that, there's another consideration for powder bed based processes. You're basically making something in a bed of powder uh, by melting with a laser. You pull the part out of the powder bed, and it's going to look a bit like a sand casting. It's going to have a very rough uh, texture to it, which is a bit of a, a worry for engineers in terms of fatigue. And other, and other reasons. So you have to think about how you're going to improve the surface texture of your part. In the case of this component, it's fairly straightforward. The interior is going to be machined anyway to accept the fork uh, tube. That's the, the area shown in green. And the gray area can be um, improved by um, grip blasting. So we've kind of ticked off that box in terms of our design, uh, design process. So we've, we've come up with a design we think we can make. We think it does a job. Uh, and so what's next? Well, essentially, because you've um, 
tweak the model from what the algorithm suggested you should use, you would typically want to validate what you've uh, designed. So the next thing is to do a quick uh, FEA. Again, we were able to do this in SOLIDWORKS because it has a simulation uh, module, so it just stayed in the same environment. You run your simulation. In the case of um, this fork, you can see we've got an improved factor of safety compared to the original component, um, which, is, which is encouraging. And uh, in addition to the, looking at the stress, you're typically going to want to just check the deflection. So you don't want something that's all wobbly. Um, and so in this case, you can see that the, the predicted deflection of this part is, is basically very similar to the original component. So it ticks that box as well. Um, and so really, the design phase of, of uh, this uh, project is complete. We've, we've run through um, all, of these, all of these steps. And what's interesting for me is that when you do um, a process like this, the designer's not actually doing any design, really. There's no kind of parametric design going on, trying out different shapes, seeing how they fit. You basically give all the problem to an algorithm and then take what the algorithm suggests, obviously look at it with a, an engineer's head on, but so you don't actually go through this process of all the, the reiteration. So it's a different uh, approach. Um, so we finished the project. Um, there's a natural question, really, which, um, having done this, was, well, how much would it cost to make? So we had a quick look at that as well. Um, if you put four of these parts on a bed, uh, which will, they'll fit on a, um, a 250 size additive manufacturing machine, the kind of uh, the elements of the cost are shown here. You've got to prepare the files. You need an operator uh, preparing the build and taking the stuff off the build. You've got the build time itself, 65 hours in this case. You've got powder at about eight pound a kilo for um, this uh, this aluminium alloy, and post processing cost, which is getting the parts off of the build substrate, getting the sports off, doing the, um, the grit blasting, is uh, estimated at about 230 pounds. So uh, for a part, uh, for one of those parts, what's the cost? It's gonna be about 1200 pounds. Um, and as a ballpark figure, about 2,500 pounds a kilo for a selective laser melting is, is, is about right. So um, that, that's, um, that's a reasonable cost. Quite a lot of money, obviously. And just to sort of break that down uh, as a pie chart, if you were doing this uh, um, process, you can see that about two thirds of the cost is the, the, the AM machine cost. So it's a depreciation um, and the long build time. So there's a quick message there to the, uh, to the manufacturers. You know, you've got to bring your prices of your machines down. It'll make the process more, more accessible to, to people. So it's too expensive for match production. I mean, 1200 pounds is, is too much. Um, so, possibly race use. So, the, the race alloy is a different spec, an aerospace grade uh, aluminium alloy, and the SLM uh, aluminium range can't really match those properties. So, there's always the option of uh, moving to titanium, so higher specific strength than the aluminium, but also obviously uh, denser, 70% denser. So, uh, the next step would be to try and do the algorithm uh, part again with a stronger material and see if the reduced mass that it comes up with is actually less than the original aluminium part. So that would be the next step uh, for uh, uh, GRM and uh, KTEC. And that was really the sort of design phase. And all I wanted to do really now was just have a look at it from um, the point of view of an SME who is thinking, okay, that sounds quite straightforward. How can, how can I get into this uh, process and start designing this sort of stuff? So this is a conventional workflow. So if you typically take um, an SME that manufactures component, components by CNC, this would be a sort of uh, typical workflow. You'd ask your designer to come up with an idea. The, idea. the designer would do all the parametric stuff, come up with a CAD model. And once the CAD model is ready, create manufacturing drawings, give them downstream to uh, the person on the CNC machine. They take the drawings and use those to create the, the part, and out would come the part. So um, what's different? Uh, to, uh, in trying to use the workflow I've just described in terms of software and training. Well, basically, uh, you come at the, the problem from a uh, literally and figuratively different angle. So, you, you, as we've seen, you ask a, a, an algorithm to do the work for you and create a model based on that suggestion that the algorithm gave you. So, you're going to need uh, this step, which is new to, uh, to you if you're just using a normal CAD software. Um, once you've uh, done that, you, you still end up with a CAD model. You're then going to need to do the preparation, which was adding the supports um, and all the stuff that to do with getting the build uh, file ready. And then you chuck it in an air machine, out it comes, uh, but it's still going to need machining. You're still going to need to drill out holes and do datum surfaces, do all the post-processing machining work. So you're still going to need your manufacturing drawings, albeit for a different, with different instructions. Um, so there are these extra steps involved for additive manufacturing. Um, but there are bureaus around the country that can do um, 3D printing in, of metals. 
Um, there are various ones around. Some of them are certified to aerospace uh, for aerospace components, so you can be sure that you're going to get a, a good quality component from them. In which case, um, as an SME or um, someone just getting into it doesn't want to buy the machine, you can discount this, this part of your uh, workflow, and you're basically left with just this new uh, topology optimization or other algorithm that you need to buy. Um, so, if we just look at a couple of options for that, um, there are two options on the market at the moment. You've got your high-end powerful uh, algorithms that can do all sorts of engineering problems. They can do transient uh, situations, they can do thermal um, modeling, they can do um, resonant frequency stuff, motor analysis. And then you've got the lightweight to simpler stuff, simpler user interface, simpler um, capabilities. Um, so some examples, Altair bring out a program called Abstract. Uh, VRMD bring out Genesis, similarly bring out Tosca. They've all got a very steep learning curve, need a lot of investment in time and training. Um, the, the lightweight options, such as Altair Inspire, is pretty easy to pick up, um, so that's the second option. And recently there's a third option um, coming onto the market, which are the ones that are integrated into your CAD package. So if you already use CAD, and you use one of these two, SolidWorks or SpaceClaim, there are uh, kind of add-in modules that you can use. Um, so GRM's Trueform is the one we use in this project. Uh, another one is uh, by Limit State. They've bought out an optimizer, or just about to bring out an optimizer, which uses a truss kind of solution. So instead of filling the space with a kind of blobby thing, it uses trusses, uh, as in a bridge sort of structure, and you get uh, components that have an alternative uh, approach to their geometry. But this is really good news, really, for um, people, and from, I'm happy to see it, that we're integrating software and making the designer's workflow uh, easier. So um, that's, that's good news. And really, just to wrap up, um, the MTC, we, um, we look at the design process within Additive. We also look at the process itself, how to make the machines more reliable, how to make the process more reliable, quality, uh, how to characterize the powder you're going to use, how to, how to inspect the parts that you make. But so one element of all that work is the design. And we are interested in standardizing design rules so that designers have uh, rules on how to manufacture and also advise on all of these various software packages. So apart from the optimization, there are different CAD packages, there are different file preparation packages, there's a whole range, and we have uh, several of those at the MTC. And we are also working with vendors uh, like GRM to try and improve the, the software tool set and make it more user-friendly and integrated. And also we want to look at the value proposition. So when is it actually worth using additive? I mean, this fork uh, as it stands in aluminum is not worth it. Is it worth it in titanium? How do you make that decision? And these are all things that we are uh, interested in at the MTC. So um, uh, that's how this project uh, was of interest to us. And just to sort of uh, highlight the fact that we, um, we work with um, funding bodies. So this project was partly funded by CASIM, which is um, for Midlands-based SMEs who are interested in modeling and simulation. There are several other programs around. There's an SME REACH program. So there are various grants available from the government to help people uh, get into uh, all sorts of stuff that's being researched at these centers including additive manufacturing. So if you are uh, interested um, in, in this, you can uh, feel free to come along and uh, contact us about getting involved in doing a project with us. So just to summarize, the bar's quite high still for additive manufacturing, still very expensive. I mean, what's 300 grams worth? Um, the bar is lower for access now because this new software coming out, which is encouraging, and the vendors are really cottoning onto the fact that the, the workflow needs to be uh, made easier. And we work with uh, companies, not only large industrial companies, but SMEs as well, to remove barriers for them adopting uh, the process. And uh, yeah, that's my presentation. Thank you.